Activision Blizzard continues to face the consequences of their actions, a concept that abusers within the company and enablers are not familiar with. That is, until the state of California issued the DFEH lawsuit that has brought a lot of stories to the surface that have emphasized a bro culture that has enabled harassment, that has enabled misconduct, abuse, and discrimination. And so now we're seeing the Activision Blizzard community signal boost all of this. We're seeing media outlets doing investigations and reporting on all of this. Employees are mass protesting and will not be giving up and letting things slide. The government issued their own lawsuit. Investors most recently issued their own lawsuit over Activision Blizzard's lack of disclosure of investigations from the DFEH going on and the fact that this culture has been permeating Blizzard for years and years and years. Now, as if all that wasn't enough, another entity from which Activision Blizzard is facing scrutiny from is sponsors with a number of major sponsors having pulled out from particularly their esports endeavors. So I reported a couple days ago how T-Mobile had removed their branding from the Overwatch and Call of Duty League, leading people to speculate that they pulled their sponsorship after all of the horrific stories began to surface, and it's been confirmed since that T-Mobile did in fact pull out. You can see right here in the before and after of these marketing images how T-Mobile was at one point featured, and that logo is now gone. News outlet Polygon also reported on this, and scrolling down their article, you'll find yet another comparison where you'll see the T-Mobile logo prominently feature, but that has since been completely removed. Now, among other sponsors for the Overwatch League include Xfinity, IMB, Coca-Cola, State Farm, Cheez-It, Pringles, and TeamSpeak, and a number of those have already pulled out, which I'll get to in a bit. And then as far as the Call of Duty League goes, partners include the U.S. Army, Astro, Zenny Gaming, Scuff, Mountain Dew, Game Fuel, and USAA Insurance. Overwatch is a particular sticking point, as that's a game that continuously emphasizes how we need more heroes in the world. And this is a franchise that's made by a company that's been housing quite the villains over the years. Which is why beyond just T-Mobile, other sponsors that pulled out include Coca-Cola and State Farm, which are pretty significant sponsors. Coca-Cola in particular, I mean, I mean, it's Coca-Cola. And then one more on top of that is reports that Kellogg has pulled from Overwatch sponsorship over troubling Blizzard allegations. Kellogg, for those who don't know, own both Cheez-It and Pringle, so these two have essentially pulled out as well alongside Coca-Cola and State Farm, leaving the Overwatch League with very few sponsors. As far as Kellogg is concerned, a spokesperson issued the following statement, we find these allegations troubling and inconsistent with our commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion. While Activision Blizzard has announced plans to address the challenging issues it faces, we will not be moving forward with any new programs this year, but will continue to review progress made against their plans. State Farm also provided a statement as detailed here by a Washington Post article covering all of the sponsors that have pulled out. A spokesperson for State Farm said that the insurance provider is reevaluating our limited marketing relationship with the Overwatch League, and the company has requested that no advertisements run during the matches this weekend. And finally, a statement from a Coca-Cola spokesperson said that the company is aware of the allegations surrounding Activision Blizzard and has been closely monitoring the situation. We are working with our partners at Blizzard as we take a step for a moment to revisit future plans and programs. Also, let's not pretend as if companies like Kellogg, T-Mobile, Coca-Cola, State Farm, don't have their own skeletons in their closets. Let's not act like these are virtuous companies who've done nothing wrong. But Activision Blizzard is the subject of these recent allegations. Activision Blizzard is in dire need of accountability, so any damage that can be done to them and the executives who are scrambling to mitigate this PR nightmare is something that I'm all for at this stage, especially given the horrifying nature of the stories that we're hearing from former and current employees. Speaking of which, employees continue to protest, and one way they're doing so is by speaking out to media outlets and sharing their stories. And we've got the biggest batch of sources speaking out yet, coming in the form of a Bloomberg article published by Jason Schreier, who tweeted this, an in-depth look at Blizzard's sexist culture based on interviews with more than 50 current and former employees. I mean, it is unprecedented for that many sources to speak out at the same time, which really goes to show the kind of fervor that there is behind the internal protests within Activision Blizzard, 
with employees seeking for executives to make tangible changes that appeal to their demands, not meeting halfway, but executives meeting employees full way. So here's the article in question. I'd like to go through some of the important bits, share my own thoughts along the way. Beginning with the title, Blizzard turned game developers into rock stars, misbehavior followed. They took key developers behind some of their most successful products like World of Warcraft, gave them a whole lot of power, and then they let it get to their heads and they got away with just way too much. One individual Bloomberg calls out is a man going by the name Ben Kilgore, the chief technology officer and Morhaime's heir apparent at the time back in 2018. But then out of the blue, he was let go from the company. And while emails sent to employees detailing his departure didn't actually say why he was let go, and these emails never do, as that would mean admitting culpability, which obviously leaders and executives and managers at this company don't tend to do. It didn't take long for employees to figure out that it likely had to do with his behavior as he presided over the most notorious group of sexist drinkers at the Irvine, California headquarters where sexism and drinking were rampant. He was among the worst offenders. And then a number of employees recalled what happened after when Derek Ingalls, who is now the head of technology department, when he was asked why this all happened, his response raised many eyebrows. This is the piece of advice that he concluded with as part of the explanation. Don't sleep with your assistant, but if you're going to sleep with your assistant, don't stop. I don't think I really have to explain the number of ways in which this statement is inappropriate, especially in a professional setting. And apparently a representative from Human Resources was present. They just stood silently by and let this fly. And those kinds of comments from people with power were seen as commonplace within the company, which is rather disturbing. And just how useless HR is, is a huge part of why this culture has permeated. HR are the ones who employees are supposed to be able to go to in order to be protected, in order to ensure there's accountability for perpetrators, but HR would often do nothing, discourage employees outright from reporting their superiors, or would be in on it. Bloomberg reports here six women said they reported incidents to Blizzard's HR department and saw no results. Layer that on top of the rock star status that senior developers within the company perceived themselves to have, and you've got a recipe for this kind of stuff just flying. A former employee put it as follows, it is absolutely a rock star mentality and it touched almost every aspect of Blizzard culture. These developers were untouchable. Not only could they tell you how to do your job, but they had so much power they could do whatever they want in line of sight with their other powerful friends. And that's one of the things that's prominently reported among employees is that a lot of the abusive behavior, a lot of the inappropriate behavior happened out there in the open. It wasn't just something that they kept low key. It was blatantly out there. And yet higher ups never seek to punish these individuals. Employees were just left to essentially treat this as if it were normal. Former creative director of World of Warcraft, Alex Afrasiabi at one point just straight up posted some of the inappropriate exchanges between him and his colleagues about the women that they were gonna bring into the hotel room to the Cosby suite, posted that on Facebook, a screenshot of it as a flex and suffered no consequences until many years later. And even then, suffering the consequences, putting it lightly, he was quietly let go with no reasons provided. They gave him a golden parachute by allowing him to leave quietly without his exploits being made known to the public. And it's only now that the DFEH has issued the lawsuit and employees are speaking out and all these stories surrounding Alex Afrasiabi and other Blizzard employees are surfacing that he's finally truly in deep trouble and unlikely to be hired by other companies with how public this knowledge has become. Bloomberg then emphasizes how numerous current and former employees have stated that Blizzard management set the tone by hiring mostly men, stoking their egos and often overlooking or being unaware of their misbehavior. And there's one particular trend that didn't help matters, the trend of executives often courting and marrying lower ranked employees. As noted here by Bloomberg, Blizzard co-founder and former CEO Mike Morhaime married a Blizzard business director in 2010. Another co-founder of Blizzard, Frank Pierce, left his wife for a Blizzard customer representative and they wedded in 2012. Finally, J. Allen Brack, the most recent president who is now leaving the company, also married a lower level employee. Now, it's not for me to say who people are or aren't allowed to marry, as long as it's consensual, which it was. 
But when you've got that trend on top of the culture, it set a precedent that made some female employees uncomfortable as the perception was that men could do this, that it was all about getting in a position of power and then courting the women who work under them. Combined with the testosterone fueled arrogance and heavy drinking that were a regular part of office culture, it all led to frequent and often unwanted advances. Bloomberg then points out a video that the company released for its 10th anniversary, and this was many, many years ago, but it prominently spotlights the kind of culture that has permeated within the company and has continued to permeate, referring to a video that condescendingly describes the easy laugh and sister-like qualities of Blizzard's first female employee. And this video was actually leaked by a prominent game developer and animator going by the name Jonathan Cooper. Here's the video in question. It looks something like this, and it sounds something like this. But then Blizzard hired their first female employee. She brought a certain calm and serenity to the hectic workplace. Perhaps it was her easy laugh that inspired so many smiles. Or perchance it was her little sister-like demeanor that brought a bit of sunshine into the humdrum lives of the grizzled crew. So this was obviously a very different time. Still doesn't make it okay. And the fact that this kind of vibe is still so emblematic within Blizzard today is kind of the heart of the issue. And then right down here, we have a set of four images that is, I guess, also a part of that 10th anniversary video that only paints a worse picture. Top 10 reasons it's great to work at Blizzard among the reasons include number 10, no matter how you're dressed, they still listen to you. And looking at the photo here, well, I mean, this just kind of speaks for itself. Very kind of infantile. Then you've got reason number six here. Girls will be seen with you even if you're not holding a dollar. And then the number one reason that was listed in this video was the senior vice president being half naked dancing in a cage. So... Yeah, that's yikes. And this kind of attitude, this kind of mentality, unfortunately, hasn't stopped. And if anything, it would seem as though it's gotten worse as power and success got to the heads of senior developers and executives and leaders within the company. A former employee actually notes how she noticed the change in a portion of her colleagues once World of Warcraft took off. Their ego filled the room. They thought so much of themselves and what they had done, especially after they received profit-sharing bonuses that amounted to quite a bit of money and suddenly you would see fancy cars populating the parking lot and that's when the egos really started to kick in, making the culture that much worse. There are Bloomberg sources who report that Blizzard's top executives told a group of his staff that young women, both fans and colleagues, saw them as superstars, so why shouldn't they benefit sexually from that. And using that rock star status, especially fans who know who these senior developers are and the kind of popularity that they were garnering as the face of Blizzard and the face of World of Warcraft and these popular products, they began to abuse their powers like that to take advantage of these fans and their co-workers, according to a former community manager at Blizzard. There are reports of females who learned to avoid the bar at the Hilton Hotel near the convention center. They knew that was a threat zone because of Alex Afrasiabi and the whole Cosby suite. And there's still some contention as to where that name came from. Some employees have reported to New Salas that it had to do with the carpet in the room resembling Cosby sweaters. Others thought that the implication, especially given what Cosby was convicted for, was quite apparent even at that time. But it doesn't matter what the origin of the name is. What matters is what took place in the Cosby suite. And it was basically a bait for women that they intended to inappropriately seduce. You combine this discriminatory work culture on top of the fact that there were far more men working at Blizzard than women with women being outnumbered four to one as of 2017. And you've got a situation where women, especially with all the discrimination against them in terms of not just the abuse and misconduct, but also in terms of salaries and promotions, they really had to claw their way up and that created a competitive work environment where women were at each other's throats. As noted by a former employee, because there were so few women, the women really had to compete to stand out with their peers. It created a really toxic competitive environment, not just between the men and women at Blizzard, but the women themselves, especially when men were treating women as competition, who gets to sleep with who first, and uh, essentially whoever their ideal version of a female employee was would be more likely to rise and just that kind of expectation and that kind of mentality created this really toxic culture even amongst the female employees. And then more reports of some of the misconduct that was seen at the studio including new female employees often being greeted by 
men who would line up to introduce themselves on esports teams. Men would give unwanted back rubs, make inappropriate moaning noises during meetings, discuss their sexual exploits in detail. And despite all this being out there in the open or being reported to HR, in very clear terms, they didn't touch him. Another former employee reports having worn shorts to Blizzard one day and one of her colleagues commenting on her ass as a result. And when she reported that to HR, nothing happened and she never wore shorts to the office again, as obviously that kind of comment isn't welcome in a professional environment. The article then dives a bit into Mike Morhaime, the former CEO of Blizzard who left in 2018 and beloved amongst many employees within the company. He was soft-spoken, gregarious, and adored by many Blizzard employees, but that warm style of leadership acted as a blind spot, or could act as a blind spot, according to Bloomberg. He was almost too nice to the point where uh, he would often give abusers the benefit of the doubt, and he was also himself shielded from misbehavior, and he essentially extended too many chances or let folks, abusers, perpetrators, who engaged in that kind of misbehavior walk over him is what former employees report. Apparently, Bloomberg saw a private Facebook post that a former assistant of Mike Morhaime's forwarded to Bloomberg, and there she wrote about how she had informed him and other executives about rampant misconduct, and yet they haven't done anything about it. Now, Morhaime recently came out with a statement admitting culpability, saying that, you know, I failed my employees and whatnot. And this is after he left Blizzard and he's now at Dreamhaven, which is his own indie studio. And while he is among few who have actually said it's my fault, doesn't change the fact that the past is still the past and all that damage is still there and it's permanent for the employees. And Mike Morham on some level has to answer for that. You know, an apology isn't enough. It's going to be through his actions that he'll be defined on whether on whether he's learned his lesson. The article then takes us back to Ben Kilgore, the former chief technology officer, longtime head of that group. Two employees said that they saw Kilgore touch female colleagues inappropriately at work functions, and then the technology staff as a whole, apparently, is just... Uh, very complacent. Staff within that division often got drunk during work hours or showed up hangover, vomited in trash cans, held after work hazing rituals where recruits would be expected to take shots every half an hour. The drinking got bad enough that in 2019, which is actually fairly recent, Blizzard enacted a two drink maximum rule at after work functions to stave off some of the behavioral issues as well as cut down on drunk driving, something that happened frequently enough and obviously endangers everyone around them. The article then tackles the mentality of an up-and-coming developer for whom Blizzard is sort of the dream place to work at, given their stature as a studio that has worked on some of the most renowned and prominent game franchises in the history of gaming. As genuine fans of Blizzard who get to work at this company, they had rose-tinted glasses that blinded them or that gave him this mentality of some of the stuff here that feels wrong is probably normal and I should just let it slide. So here's one former employee who said, when you're someone who works at a company like Blizzard, it's almost like you ignore everything that's happening because you want to be there so badly. You stop seeing things that are bad as bad. You get blinded by what you wanted this to be rather than what it truly is. And when the ugly side shows itself, because of those rose tinted glasses, because you wanted this dream job so badly, you start kind of going to denial mode, and that's kind of what happened to some of these employees. And Blizzard very clearly took advantage of this, took advantage of the stature that they have and the kind of influence that they have as a company that is so prominent in the games industry. Blizzard took advantage to the point where many former Blizzard staff said they took pay cuts in exchange for the prestige of working at the company, notoriously known as a Blizzard tax. Plenty of reports here of people who really were just scraping by to work at this company. And as more and more employees began to grow disgruntled about the pay disparity within the company, we started to see developers come together to release this spreadsheet where employees would share their salaries to compare and contrast as part of a revolt or protest against Activision Blizzard executives, an uprising that led to them writing a letter to Blizzard's president seeking better pay, though unfortunately none of their requests have been addressed. And now with this latest protest surrounding the allegations of abuse, misconduct, harassment, discrimination, pay disparity is among the major topics of conversation and the rectifying of how payment is currently handled is among the biggest demands that employees have in their protest against the company. Here we have more reports of women, seven women who told Bloomberg 
that they made less money than male colleagues who had similar experience, even if they were working similar jobs at similar efficiency. Two women said that they were told by their managers not to discuss their salaries, not to disclose the fact that they were being underpaid, which, by the way, is against California law. There is a law called the California Equal Pay Act that was established, I believe, in 2015 or 2016 that allows employees to voluntarily disclose their salaries if they so desire. And this law also seeks to protect employees from payment and salary discrimination, which is rampant within Activision Blizzard. Now, sources also did tell Bloomberg that, you know, they were willing to put up with problems at Blizzard because they love the products, many of their co-workers, and even some aspects of the company's culture. So it wasn't as if it was all bad. There were enough good elements and they were passionate enough about what they were working on that they were willing to push through the issues that permeated the company. But things only got worse when Bobby Kotick and Activision began to seep their corporate influence more within Blizzard and Blizzard became less autonomous and there was more oversight and more pressure from Activision. Activision pushed Blizzard staff to hit unrealistic deadlines and do more work with fewer resources, increasing stress and overtime across all all levels and all this exacerbated Blizzard's problems and this kind of corporate interference is what led to the release of the notorious and god-awful Warcraft 3 Reforged, one of the most botched AAA launches in history. And the kind of oversight that Activision is enacting on Blizzard essentially has everyone on edge. They don't want to report anything bad because if they do, that might lead to resources being pulled from certain divisions that might lead to divisions being punished as a whole and so people are less prone to speak out and more prone to kind of misbehave amongst themselves because of the increased stress because of the fact that they know stuff might not get reported as bloomberg puts it here some blizzard staff refer to activision as the eye of sauron which is never a good comparison if people working under you refer to you as the eye of sauron Yeah, you're the villain in this story. With budget cuts constantly looming, managers of each department have jockeyed for resources. As a result, some are reluctant to report internal problems and risk drawing unwanted attention to their teams from corporate overlords who might punish them as a whole. And as if that wasn't bad enough, a recent revision to the performance review system forces managers to give more frequent negative reviews to employees, which will result in less generous bonuses and profit share for Blizzard employees. Managers are essentially forced to pick and choose who they favor, who to give positive reviews to, and who to give mandated negative reviews to. And that only creates a further divide between the rock stars in power and the ground floor employees, the people underneath. And a number of women who have come forward to Bloomberg said that they fear this will give managers more opportunities to discriminate in conscious and unconscious ways, and that it will further empower the company's supposed rock stars. We're talking about a company that continues to break records every year, that's making more money than ever, and yet they cannot spare paying employees properly. They cannot spare allowing managers to give as many people who deserve it positive reviews, so they get the bonuses that they deserve, which causes further friction within the company, which makes the culture that much worse it isn't just a blizzard issue activision very much has actively contributed to this and have enabled this stuff to happen employees are aware of all of this they've been aware of all of this for years and years it's only now that they feel safe and comfortable speaking out because of the dfvh lawsuit because of the protests happening within the activision blizzard community and amongst employees now that there is this fire that's rising finally employees feel like they have some power to issue demands without facing consequences as it'd be a bad look for activision to start firing people just for essentially fighting for their rights for proper equal and adequate treatment for a better work culture for a better work environment so We'll see how this continues to roll, but it seems to me as though employees are really more fed up than they've ever been. The DFEH lawsuit seems like it could be a very solid case. The investors lawsuit adding additional pressure and the sponsors pulling out, the players all rallying against Activision Blizzard. This is a wake up call, this is a reality check that Activision Blizzard sorely needed. But that's just one man's take. Let me know in the comments below what your thoughts and opinions are on sponsors pulling out of Activision Blizzard events and the 50 both current and former Activision Blizzard employees who have spoken out and what you think that signals for the future of Activision Blizzard as a company, the kinds of changes we can hope to see. 
share your thoughts below, and to be further updated on all things gaming news, reviews, and discussions, stay tuned right here on Young Yeah. I'll see you guys next time. Young out.